Good day, everyone. I am Mary Althea Dominique Rivot Lawan, a civil engineering student of Eastern Visayas State University. And in this video, we are going to explore the different techniques in problem solving, namely inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, and also including Polya's problem solving strategy. To better understand these concepts, we will be solving one example for each topic. Now, I know that mathematics is not everyone's cup of tea, but don't worry, I will make these concepts more understandable so that you may be able to catch up. Without further ado, let's start. For instance, you have a box of mangoes. You get one mango, and you see that it is yellow in color. You get another one, and you have the same observation. Again, you get another and you have the same observation as the previous ones. With these observations, it can be concluded that all the mangoes are ripe. Now, this is an example of inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is a process of reaching a general conclusion by examining specific examples. Moreover, inductive reasoning moves from specific premises to a general conclusion. Next, we move on to another case. Again, you have a box of mangoes and started to observe it. You have observed that all the mangoes in the box are yellow in color. You get one mango from the box and you know that this mango is ripe because you got it from the box full of mangoes that are yellow in color. This example exhibits deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is a process of reaching a conclusion by applying general assumptions, procedures, and principles. Moreover, deductive reasoning moves from a general premise to a more specific conclusion. Now, let us compare both concepts. Inductive reasoning has statement 1. That says, mango is a fruit, which is true. Statement number two, the box is full of fruits, which is again true. So it leads us to the conclusion that the box is full of mangoes. Now, this is logically true because mango is a fruit and the box is full of fruits. And so, the box is full of mangoes because mango is a fruit. But, this may or may not be realistically true. Because, even though the box is full of fruits and mango is a fruit, we are not sure if the fruit in the box is really mango or mangoes. Because it can be apple, orange, or whatever fruit they may be. So, this is uh, an example so this is an example of inductive reasoning we start from specific arguments to a general conclusion while for deductive reasoning we have statement one all mangoes are fruits which is in fact true statement number two all fruits have seeds which is again true so it leads us to the conclusion that mangoes have seeds. Now this is logically true because all the mangoes are fruits and all fruits have seeds. And it is also realistically true because the conclusion says that mangoes have seeds which is realistically true. So this is an example of deductive reasoning. We started from a general conclusion stated by the all here. To a specific argument. To better understand these concepts in problem solving, let us try to solve some mathematical problems using these techniques. For deductive reasoning, we have an example. You are tasked to use deductive reasoning to show that the following procedure always produces the number 5. So the procedure states, that you should pick a number, add 4 to the number, and multiply the sum by 3, subtract 7, and then decrease its difference by the triple of the original number. So with that, we come with a solution. So since this is a deductive reasoning, 
we will start with the general premise. So, our original number will be n, which is a variable. It does not have an exact value yet. So, following the procedure, add 4 to n. So, it's simply n plus 4. Next, multiply the sum by 3. So, we have here 3 times n plus 4, which is the sum. So, we what we did here is we just multiply 3 to n and 3 to 4. So, we have 3n plus 2. Next is to subtract 7 from the product. So, our product is over here. So, we're going to subtract 7 from it. So, we, we have 3n plus 12 minus 7. So, we have 12 and 7 here, like terms. So, our result would be 3n plus 5. And then, for the last um, procedure, we should subtract thrice the original number from the difference 3n plus 5. This is our difference right here. It says here that we need to subtract thrice the original number from here. So, thrice the original number, our original number is n. So, thrice the original number is 3n. So, we have here 3n plus 5 minus 3n. So, 3n minus 3n, like terms, like terms. We only have 5. So, our answer would be, so, we started with an original number n and ended with 5 following the Griffin procedure. Therefore, the procedure will always produce number 5. So, that is how you solve a mathematical problem like this using deductive reasoning. We have already discussed um, deductive reasoning. Now, it's time to discuss inductive reasoning. So, for our example here, we are tasked to use inductive reasoning to make a conjecture considering the following procedure. So, as you all know, a conjecture is a conclusion or a proposition which is suspected to be true due to preliminary supporting evidence but for which no proof or disproof has yet been found. Okay, so that's the meaning of conjecture. So moving on to our procedure, we are tasked to pick a number and multiply it by 10 and add 8 to the product. And Finally, to divide the sum by 2 and subtract 4. So, moving on to our solution. Okay, so as you remember, um, we were tasked to pick a number. So, here in inductive reasoning, we picked 6. So, here in inductive reasoning, we picked 6 as the original number. So, as you remember, um, in deductive reasoning, we just used a variable n as our original number. This is because in inductive reasoning, we are examining specific examples like 6. Whereas in deductive reasoning, we were examining a general premise, which is n. Like there is no exact value for it yet. So back to the topic. Suppose we pick 6 as the original number. So, following the procedure, okay, we have 6 as our original number. Multiply 6 by 10. So, it's simply 6 times 10. We have 60. Add 8 to the product. So, our product is 60. Plus 8 is 68. And then, we divide the sum by 2. So, 68 divided by 2 is 34 and lastly we subtract the quotient by 4 34 so minus 4 is 30 so 30 is our final answer for this procedure when we pick 6 as the original number moving on to the next solution now, let us try the procedure again 
with 7 as the original number. Okay, we have 7 here. Now we are tasked to multiply 7 by 10. So 7 times 10 is 70. Then we will add 8 to the product. So 70 plus 8 is equal to 78. Now we are to divide the sum by 2. So 78 divided by 2 is 39. And lastly, we subtract the quotient by 4. So 39 minus 4 is 35. So based from these results, what conclusion can we draw? So here, we started with 6 and the procedure produces 30. Okay, remember that. On the other hand, when we pick 7 as our original number, the procedure produces 35. Okay, so based on the results in each of these cases, the procedure produces a number that is 5 times the original number. So you can see, 6, 30, and 7, 35. 30 is actually 5 times 6, and 35 is actually 5 times 7. So, it can be conjectured that the given procedure produces a number that is 5 times the original number. That is how you come up with conclusions using inductive reasoning. So, you are to uh, examine specific examples in order to come up with a conclusion. After examining the examples, you come up with a conjecture, then you come up with a final conclusion. So here, the conclusion is that the number that is 5 times the original number is produced by the procedure. Okay, so we have already discussed deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. We now move on to our last topic for this video, which is Paulia's problem solving strategy. But before we proceed, who is Paulia? Why is it important to learn his problem solving strategy? George Paulia is one of the four most recent mathematicians who devoted much of his teaching in helping students become better problem solvers. In the book How to Solve It, he outlines a four step problem solving strategy. First is to understand the problem. Paulia suggests that a problem solver needs to become better acquainted with the problem and work toward a clearer understanding of it before progressing towards a solution. Second is to devise a plan. Paulia mentions that there are many reasonable ways to solve problems. The skill at choosing an appropriate strategy is best learned by solving many problems. Experience and practice are the best teachers for devising plans. Third is to carry out the plan. The plan gives a general outline of direction. Carrying out a plan to solve a problem is basically implementing the strategy chosen in the second step until the problem is solved or until a new course of action is suggested. One may get ideas from others in deciding the best strategy to make sure that the best solution is employed. And lastly, for the fourth step, we have to review the solution. So in reviewing the solution, we have to ensure that the solution is consistent with the facts of the problem. So that is the first one. Second, we have to interpret the solution in the context of the problem. And third is to ask yourself whether there are generalizations of the solution that could apply to other problems. So again, I will be showing an example on how to solve a problem using Paulius approach. So here's the example. In how many ways can you answer a 12 question true or false test if you answer each question with either a true or a false? So we are to use Paulius four step problem solving strategy. So for the first step, which is to understand the problem, there are 12 questions in a true-false test. So our problem here is to identify how many ways can the test be answered. 
answered with either a true or a false. So for the second part is to devise a plan. It says that you should try the strategy of working with a similar but simpler problem. So this is the part where you develop a strategy. So begin with one question and then add another progressively. Determine whether there is a pattern. A table may help visualize the relationship between the number of questions and the number of ways it can be answered by a true or false. So, for the third step is to carry out the plan. So, the plan is to make a table to help find a pattern. So, here is our table right here. On the top part, we have the number of questions. And for the bottom part, we have the number of ways on how to answer the questions. So for one question, we have two ways. For two questions, we have four ways. And for three questions, we have eight ways. Do you see the pattern now? Okay, so for one question, we only have two ways, true or false. So for two questions, we have four ways. How did that happen? So for one question, let's say for question number one, we have true or false. For question number two, we have true or false also. So it can be both true, both false, or true false, or false true. So that is why we have four ways right here. And same goes with here, when you have three questions, you have eight ways. So that is how you develop the pattern. Do you see the pattern now? Okay. So based on the table, we derive the pattern to raise to n. So what does n stand here? So n right here is the number of questions actually so find the pattern and we acquire the following values so these first three are our first example back there when we were trying to derive the pattern but as you can see right now it is already complete up to 12 so what is our answer since we have 12 questions our answer would be this 4096 ways okay so for the next part it is to review the solution findings we all know that the questions can only be answered by a true or a false but it can be observed on the table above which is I mean on the previous slide that the number of ways to answer the test may vary according to the number of questions which is true because when we only have one question we only have two ways to answer it but when we already have two questions we now have four ways to answer it okay, so thus deriving the pattern to raise to n for n represents the choices which is either true or false we have two choices true or false and n represents the number of questions okay so as i have said earlier i mentioned this earlier if you can remember okay so it leads us to the conclusion that for one question we have two ways, and as the number of questions increases, the number of ways vary along with the pattern to raise to n. Again, two is the choices, are the choices, true or false, and n is the number of questions. Therefore, in a true-false test composed of 12 questions, there are two raised to 12 ways. Or 4096 ways. Okay, so I guess this concludes our video for today. 
Thank you so much for staying with me as we dive deeper into the universe of problem solving. I hope you learned a lot on the topics and I hope that I have put mathematics in a better light for you guys. If mathematics is for everyone, then everyone is for mathematics. And the only way to learn math is through continuous practice. Never give up and keep on learning. Again, with utmost gratitude, this is Mario Thea Dominic Ribot Lawan of BSC 1B.